many of you in so long. It's great to have almost a full house. Um, really nice to see you. Thank you for coming. My name is Ann Wolf, and I'm the Andrea and John C. Dean family chief curator and associate director here at the Nevada Museum of Art. And it is uh, truly my pleasure today um, to introduce our speaker, but also to just uh, celebrate the opening this afternoon of our newest exhibition, Picasso in Clay selections from the collection of Robert Felton and Lindsay Wallace. This collection features uh, an amazing number of magnificent uh, ceramics, designed, handmade, created by Picasso. And uh, we're just so thrilled for all of the sponsors that have stepped forward to help support the exhibition. I'd like to acknowledge them now. The exhibition is sponsored by Betsy Burgess and Tim Bailey. Barbara and Chad Dans. The supporting sponsors are the Collections Committee of the Nevada Museum of Art, Tammy and Michael Germany, and Evercore Wealth Management uh, with uh, Keaton Williams, and additional support from Linda Fry. So let's please uh, acknowledge all of our sponsors. It has been uh, such a thrill to get to know uh, Bob and Lindsay over the last year, couple of years, and um, we're excited to meet so many of your family and friends who are in town for this celebration. And um, of course, on behalf of our CEO, David Walker, and all of our collections committee here at the Nevada Museum of Art, we're extremely grateful uh, that the two of you have graciously offered your entire collection of ceramics um, to the Nevada Museum of Art's permanent collection as a future request. <laughs> And the special treat is that we are going to open the exhibition early, um, right after this talk, so all of you will get uh, the first chance to see that upstairs on our third floor. So it is a pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Vivian today, uh, who I know that both of you have known for a long time and will work closely with you on your journey as collectors. Uh, Vivian Hall is the director and owner of Squire Fine Arts in Los Gatos, California. She consults and operates independently for private clients and also exhibits at antique and jewelry shows around the country. Vivian was born in England and educated in Canada. As a young person, she managed two galleries in New York City before becoming completely independent. Vivian deals in a wide variety of artworks and also fine vintage and antique jewelry. She started specializing in Picasso ceramics around 1990 and it remains her first love. She's built several large collections for clients and has collectors all over the world. So Vivian, we have a full house here as well as probably almost 100 people watching online and we're excited to have such a great turnout. So welcome. Thank you so much. That's very nice. And uh, thank you to everyone here for coming today and for having me. Um, I want to thank, of course, my dear friends, uh, Bob and Lindsay, my comrades in collecting for many, many years. Without her, we wouldn't have this beautiful collection that you've taken so much time and effort to put together. And thank you to the Nevada Museum of Art for making this full exhibition possible. Um, I view this exhibition as a rare opportunity for us to view a specific aspect of Picasso's move, which was indeed massive. And this particular aspect has been often overlooked in light of the quantity of other artworks that he made throughout his life, paintings, <clears throat> sculptures, works of art on paper, and the ceramics kind of got lost a little there for quite a few years. I would say it was about 30 years ago, perhaps, that the museums started to acquire them, collectors started to find them, and people discovered that he had done all this work in this particular meeting. Um, I think uh, we're, we're very, very lucky to have this available to us. Um, Picasso began his ceramics career, if you want, in uh, 1946. 
he went to the south of France and he was on vacation in Gauchois, having a wonderful time, who wouldn't, and heard of a small exhibition taking place in a little village nearby by the name of Valerie and decided to go to that exhibition. Um, maybe accidentally, but certainly not a very planned thing. And pottery was always a thing in Valerie. There a number of potters working there for years. And they had this exhibition, which he attended. And while there, he met and became friendly with uh, Suzanne and Georges Remier. Um, Suzanne was already uh, a renowned potter in her own right and, and remained so throughout her life, and, but introduced Picasso to the more technical aspects to get him started in pottery. So that day he met them. It, by the end of that day, he was back at the Remier's pottery called Medura in Valerie with his elbows deep in wet clay. I mean, immediately that very first day. And he created things that first day. He made, a, I think, a couple of little bowls. And also he took a, a vase or cup or something of that sort, which he converted into a little farm, which uh, is one of his favorite subjects, you know, those little misters guys with the horns. So he did that, left those pieces with the Marinese, and went on, not to return for a full year. He came back. Uh, to Valerie and to the Remiers in July of 1947. And they welcomed him back and gave them uh, most of their studio space and encouraged him to get to work. And he stayed in the south of France working with ceramics for virtually 18 years. So it became a very big part of his work. Uh, later. And he, uh, this coincides with a time in Picasso's life where these were pretty much his happiest years. And that's nice because we do see that reflected in his ceramic works. I mean, we all know of, of what a tortured life he did lead in many ways, personally and in his artwork and with the world, you know, in, in touring with war. Uh, you know, we were probably mostly familiar with this big mural, Veronica, which I think he did in 1935, around about that, which was a protest painting against the massacre, really, of, of a lot of uh, civilian people. Uh, he went through a lot, and of course, he's the quintessential starving artist at the beginning of his career. Uh, not for long, though, because he did, he did get popular, fairly quickly as for artists, for, for many of whom you have to wait till he died. <laughs> and he was popular in his lifetime. And uh, so this time that he was in the south of France were happy years for him. He met his second wife, Jacqueline, who features a lot in his works as well. And uh, those, again, uh, those feelings are reflected in the ceramics which you're going to see some very fine examples of today. They are happy, but you can almost not look at any of them and not smile. They just, they make you feel good. And that's a reflection of how he felt in that time. And living in the south of France, which is not too shabby, is it? I mean, if he had a chance to be, I'd be happy. Um, so you see that very commonly in the ceramic works as opposed to some of his other work. And, and along with that, in his ceramics, one of the things that you identify is a, uh, a, a lack of line, linear uh, shortages, basically, lines. He doesn't, the, the ceramic works are, for the most part, very simple. They're not hugely elaborate, like, say, an oil painting. And that was deliberate on his part. <laughs> Um, this economy of line, if you will. Uh, he used sparing color and strokes. Uh, they're very simple, not because he was brushed, but he wanted to reflect that simplicity and how much could be said in a piece with 
so little actually there. Uh, so you'll find those two things are, are featured strongly in his ceramic works, opposed to his other works. And uh, he also, it's interesting, the forms that he used in his ceramics, for the most part, are utilitarian, uh, almost mundane if you want, platters, plates, bowls, vases, simple things that were already being made in, in potteries. And he took those simple forms and made them into complete artworks. You know, um, we've had since the beginning of mankind, and some of it is more beautifully decorated, but still largely utilitarian, not made just to be works of art by themselves. And that's something that he did in his vision to see things differently as he did in everything, um, making these absolutely works of art. And that transformed the, the world of art pottery in the 20th century. He's really largely responsible for that. He inspired other great artists to start working in that medium who had not thought of it. People like Matisse and Chagall and Miro in particular uh, did a lot in ceramics after Picasso got that ball rolling. So he was very influential in this, just as he was in so many other aspects of art. You know, I mean, he had brought virtually invented cubism, things like that. I mean, he he's the master. Uh, and I myself in discovering ceramics some 20 odd years ago. Um, found that the one thing that was nice about the ceramic works is you could own an original work of art by the most important artists of the 20th century. Um, they were really affordable and got downright cheap, right, Bob? Like, <laughs> not so much. They got much more expensive. And now they're very expensive, of course. And that's partially because uh, we don't know how many are even available out there. Uh, you know, over the years, they're a fragile medium. They've been broken. The museums have acquired them. And so on the open market, um, there are fewer and fewer available. And because of that, of course, and the importance of Picasso and his influence in art, they've gone up and up in value. And I see no reason that they will not continue to. So again, that's another way, reason why we're very fortunate to have the um, Felt and Wallace collection being given to the museum. It's very generous. Um, shall I tell you? Oh, yes. Along with the, the uh, simplicity of the forms that he used, he was inspired in terms of subject matter by simple things around him. Uh, things like uh, animals and owls and birds and fish and goats, and, and then uh, some portraiture, like, like I mentioned, including Jacqueline, and uh, uh, other just, uh, uh, let's see, still lives, uh, and bullfights. Bullfights were a very popular uh, subject matter for him. Maybe we are not so fond of bullfights, but they were extremely popular at the time, and he in particular loved them. So it's not a subject matter for everybody, which, um, but uh, I'll mention, I'll mention in fact, that uh, I tried to uh, sell a Picasso many years ago to Bob. It was a very large charger, a black and white, but utterly cubist, just such an exciting piece. And I was all excited to tell him, Bob, I've got this, it's fantastic, you're gonna love it. And he was like, I don't like it. I don't like it. You don't like it. <laughs> but he did. And I understand, you know, and that's the beauty of collecting. This collection reflects the things that Bob and Lindsay like. Um, in particular, you'll see owls, which they particularly love. Um, but the other subjects, again, they're happy. There's a lot of this little uh, uh, fawn that's mischievous and lovers and dancers. It, again, that happiness you see over and over in his ceramic works. It's very, very nice to see. 
Um, so I answer that. Just the fact that, of course, in the simplicity of his ceramics, you can you can be sidetracked a little and think, you know, I'll often hear people say, well, I could do that. Well, yeah. You could, but you did it, but, you know, um, especially when he did it, because it's all about his mindset. You know, you, you're familiar with the uh, Apple campaign of think different when and Picasso featured in that, but along with some other people. And, uh, you know, the, he did think different. I mean, personally, I could recall uh, a load of bicycle parts, which he put together and made a goat out of it. I mean, I don't know, nobody would normally look at that and see a girl. It's just the way he saw things very, very differently. And that's, that's exciting and fun. And uh, he said himself, others have seen what is and asked why. I have seen what could be and asked why not. And that was his viewpoint in, in virtually all of it. And I have so many questions. So here, here he begins with his. And there he is with Suzanne uh, with a simple platter that he's working on. And um, another thing about the simplicity I was mentioning, the economy of wine, there's not a lot of color in many of them. There's exceptions. This is a nice one. Um, but he liked the medium itself. You'll see a lot in plain clay, a lot in a white biscuit, uh, he didn't use a lot. Now there are some that are a great exception to that. This is an interesting piece. This was made in 1947. And so it's very early. And uh, this brings up a, another point as well. He did make unique objects, which are extremely valuable today. They're priced like, you know, like a painting, very, very expensive. But while he was there working and using the Madura pottery for his own use, he gave the Revians the right to duplicate pieces that he would make. So, you know, he made this. This is the second, second edition, as they're called. Okay, these are all limited editions, uh, varying in size from the smallest being uh, about 20. Uh, for other pieces he made as many as 500 of, no more than 500 in any of his editions. Some of the editions are numbered, um, maybe number three of 300 or something like that. Many are not. However, we do know exactly how many he made of, of his ceramic editions because they are completely documented, I mean, to the T, by Alan Ramier, who put together the catalog Raisonne of his ceramic works. Um, so this is the second one only that he made that he allowed to be duplicated uh, in 1947. There were 200 numbered copies of this, not very many. And this is one, and this is also, also made in the same year. These are the two of three that Bob owned when I met him. Um, at these two beautiful early pieces, which he had bought in Paris. Uh, this piece exemplifies another uh, feature of his ceramic work, aside from painting. He, many of his pieces are very heavily textured. He used what's called a boring rod and he would dig into that clay and, and create and lift. And, and you'll see in some of the pieces how amazingly textured they are, which is probably why he didn't always use color in some instances, because the textures were set a great deal. These had wonderful cheeks. And uh, Bob of these two, and I'll show you later on another one. This is, this is just a very nice uh, feature. Again, it's a bird called Big Job, a Big Dormer, but I like the brickwork around the outside. This one is an absolute favorite of mine, and it's very rare. There were only uh, 20 in the edition. Uh, and you can see it has these beautiful uh, cubist elements to it. It's called Capricorn Field, four faces, 
but it's you can look at it any way you want. It's a really exciting piece. I, I love it. Again, the color is minimal. It's a fabulous piece. This is amusing. This form I'll show you later is a form that he used to create owls. So one of the, one day was instead of making an owl, he decided I'm going to make an owl woman. So he made the fun of her hair, the tail of the owl, and then this top knot she's got on. It, it's an amusing, happy piece. I like it. This is adorable. This is a chouetant, the little the young wood owl, a little baby owl. Everybody loves this fox. It's just charming. And it's cute again, you know? And it's also, you can't see through these photographs, but it's very textural as well. Uh, all those feathers are carved out of the, the ceramic as well. And it's a very important feature. And it'll be wonderful for you when you go into the gallery and you see these pieces in person and you can really grasp that. It's one thing that you just can't get, you know, from a photograph. After I, I knew Bob, after I met Bob, I sold him one piece. I then said, aha, <laughs> I, this guy might like some more. And I called him up and uh, said, you know, I, I have further because of ceramics I just acquired. He might be interested. And he was, yes, I love me, you know, send me photographs. Send me photographs. And I was like, no, no, I'm not going to send a photograph. No chance. I'm bringing these to you. You have to see them in person. I'll go anywhere, I'll go to your office, I'll go to your house, I'll meet you anywhere, but I, you must see them in person. And of course, Bob totally got that and never asked again for me to just send him photos. I would just drop it to him personally so he could decide what he liked. But usually he liked them all. <laughs> Always surprised me every time. Um, but that feature of seeing them in person is really important to that. This is a wonderful piece. Uh, Bob bought this as a gift for Lindsay. Um, I just love this film. And again, when you see this in person, if it does not your socks off, it's, it's, it's so textural and so colorful. It's terrific. But yet a very simple subject, right? And like this, it's fish. Although this fish to me looks prehistoric practically. That's a strange looking fish. Um, but this is got a kind of a cute story behind it in terms of um, how I acquired it. You don't know where you're going to find these pieces. Nowadays more, we're aware of them. So most people know what they have a Picasso, but there were times when people didn't. This came to me, uh, a dealer in Germany contacted me. Well, I did not know, I don't know how he found it. And negotiated a price with me sent it to me, I purchased it, lovely, everything happy. And he would not give me any photo notes on it. And that's not, not always necessary with these because they are so well documented. Um, although now they are in fake, so photo notes can't help. He wouldn't tell me anything about it. Never mind, never mind, never mind, I bought it. And then afterwards he said, well, now I can tell you where I got it. Because he didn't want to tell you because I didn't pay anything for it, and I didn't think you'd give me a lot of money if you knew I got it for free. He got it in a dump. In, I can't visualize this stuff, okay? He called it a concrete dump, like just rocks and cement blocks and a Picasso ladder. I have no idea, but it was his lucky day, I'll tell you. So anyway, who knows where they are or how many are left if you're leaving them in a dump. Um, this one is interesting because he... I don't know of others where he used pastel. He actually drew pastel on the pieces. Now, in these editions, it always comes up um, where people want to know, did he really do it himself or did he have other people do it? He made the, always made the first one, maybe the first two or three. Um, and then he had other potters working for him that would do the two. Um, which I don't, some people are bothered by that, and I don't really get that because if you look at lithography, for example, you know, you're, it's this, a very similar thing, and in fact, even less uh, hands-on 
then the, the pottery the artist makes an artist proof or sample and then decides how many are going to be in the edition and prints those off and they can be very valuable and, and very desirable so with the ceramics the similar kind of thing we had our had artists helping them but this is interesting because of that and here's the wolf fight i finally got on into and not that long ago but it's so colorful among the most colorful of the ceramic works. And it's it's really, if, if a bullfight can be happy, this is a happy bullfight, you know? And I understand if you don't think it can ever be happy, but you need to look in the background, all those little blobs at the top, that's the crowd, you know? It's clever and it's fun, it's funny. And uh, here again, another one where the, the crowd, oh, then we got a side of the sun. Uh, lacking color, but it's it's amusing, and this is also amusing. This lovely little hand who has quite wonderful breasts for a hand, um, <laughs> and, uh, and when you see her in person, she's got very googly eyes too. That's a strange. I mean, I don't know what he was thinking, but here you go. It's adorable, and here this is great. It's love, <laughs> fat, happy owl. And this beautiful nocturnal background, with the stars out at night. And this was a favorite of Lindsay's and Bob's because, and I'm sure up here in Reno, you must have a lot of owls, right? Um, but we do too in the Bay Area, which is where I'm from. And, and uh, Lindsay and Bob lived in the top of a mountain in Berkeley, and they had a lot of owls up there. And uh, it's one of their favorite subject matters, and no wonder this guy is wonderful, fat and happy. This is an interesting piece. Okay, this is part of a pair. There's a there's the woman, and there's the man. <laughs> man said it right. Um, okay, so when I when I met Bob, we met at a show, and I had um, this one up for sale. I, I did used to put very many up for sale. This is a long time ago. Most people honestly had no idea what they were. And then if you told them they didn't really believe it was real anyway. So I but I would put them up because I might have the fortune of someone coming in and going, I have some of those at home and I could possibly buy them. So I had this one up for sale and Bob negotiated its purchase. I had not met him before. Then after he bought it, told me that he had this one at home. This is the only other one that he had when, when we first met. And of course, I mean, they're just great together. It's uh, terrific. Um, another owl, completely different. This one uh, features uh, a very heavy glaze on it, a thick uh, paint that's fairly typical on a lot of pieces. Uh, it's, it's very crazed, this piece. It got crazed in the kiln when it was fired. And then, then over time, it's also been gotten crazy. You see them that way. It's not, you know, it's not to the detriment of the piece. They're perfectly original. And it's, it's just a feature of, of the glazes that he used. And this one is rather colorful. And here's a, he did like women. We know that. He wasn't very nice to them, but, but he loved women. So here he's took this picture and made this, we even gave her, gave her a necklace, which is quite pretty. Um, again, it's amusing. And here a still life, a really colorful still life. It's, it, it glows, I hope. You know, when you see these upstairs, you can really appreciate that factor about them. And again, it's happy. It's happy. This is perhaps not happy in the sense that this is a tormented pawn, a fawn. To a tormented fawn's face. Um, I don't know what he's tormented about, but it's this exhibits the strongest textural qualities when you see it. And it's a great color as well. And it's large. This is a large charger that, that you see here. Uh, so it makes a, a heck of an impact. This is um, a ceramic that he made. Uh, and this is not part of the collection, but I show you this because he also worked in another medium. He had very few 
uh, maybe 20 different ones, and there were only 20 of each of these made. That's in sterling silver in the Felton Wallace collection. Sterling silver is beautiful. Uh, it was uh, put together by uh, Hugo Brothers, a uh, great grandson of Victor Hugo, the author. And he did work in silver uh, for Picasso and also then for other artists. Uh, and this piece, they have in silver and they're extremely rare. Um, it's obviously just a face. And again, this really um, shows that economy of line that I was talking about. It's, it's very simple, but we get it. And this spring, uh, again, it's very textural when you see it. And it's, it's fun. You can't walk by this and not be happy. It, it's just really, and it's large too. So it really makes an impact. He made a few of these little black and white pictures. This with a little farm's face on it. Um, and they were made in the 50s. Uh, and they're very popular. Charm. There, this is great. This, again, it's really large. It's a big charger. And this, look at that owl's face. I mean, it, it's really fun. The difficulty in this piece, uh, we framed it because we needed a way to display it. But you really can't. We lost in so doing the back of it. And look at this beautiful back with this abstract design, it, it, it's just terrific. And the combination of the black with the clay, it's just so striking. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece. And in this one, you can also, I don't know if you can see from there. It's a limited edition of over 200. I showed you one of the markings. Um, but like I said, we know how many not just in his ceramic works, you know, all of his work. He's probably the most documented artist of his time. He had people following him around, that Richardson guy who put the three books on, on Picasso, followed every detail of his life. Uh, he's very documented, which is great because again, she, um, his fortunes. Uh, and some were destroyed and stolen during the war and all of that kind of thing. This is an amusing piece. She makes me laugh. I call her ponytail girl, but she's really called woman tankard. Um, but her ponytail is the handle. Like it, it's just cute. He just had cute ideas all the time. This is lovely. I think the birds on this are, are terrific. And it's a, a nice size fat little picture. Beautiful color. Uh, am I going over time? This is great. I just love the guy's beard, right? This this uh, unshaven face. And this, again, these face plates are among the most colorful works he did in ceramic. This one I love. Again, that kind of cubist look that it has. And uh, nice blobs of color. It's, these are charming. This is a, another design that was very unique to him. He, he made lino cuts, which are prints uh, that look like this in, in a clay color with black. And this one he actually made on a tile to, you know, it forms a picture. I and mean, he did quite a few of these. But this is a nice example. And I know that this was never really your favorite, but I, I, um, I, like, I like these. I like the dimension in them. Um, this one got left in a bathroom in a house in British Columbia in Canada. You know, when you sell a house, you, your drapes, if you leave them on, they go to the buyer. This person left the castle hanging in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. And this guy got in touch with me and flew down here with it. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty. I mean, it must have been an amazing house. But this again features those wonderful textural qualities that we're talking about. And here, back to that original form of an owl and a very colorful one indeed, and a happy one. This one is wonderful. It's very deeply cut with that boring rod. And uh, again, it's so textural and beautiful. So you have the beautiful collection of uh, Dr. Lindsay Wallace and Mr. Robert Felton. Congratulations, and I'm happy for all of you that you're going to get to see it today. Uh, thank you for all your time.
If you have, and, and not this too, either buy or sell your hotel sales, but yeah, if yeah, you have yeah, questions, questions. I, my email is on it. Oh, yes, we're going to do it fun day. I was ready to leave. Sorry. <laughs> yes. So, um, I'm wondering if, if you have children grow this way or just um, decorate these that have been grown. Okay, so I have to repeat the question for yeah. you. Um, Zoom. Did he actually throw the clay himself or were they presented to him? I would say in the additions, mostly they were prepared for him. But yes, he did throw the clay in instances. When he first started, yeah, he just grabbed what they were making, you know, flowers, plates, and made them into things. But the, uh, some definitely he did throw himself. I mean, not the owls are probably an example. I don't know that for a fact, but that they don't seem like a regular form that he would just throw what he made. So he probably did throw the prototype at least. Yes. Did he apply the glazes with his fingers, his thumb? Did he apply the glazes or the paint with his uh, thumb uh, or paintbrushes? I can't honestly say I know that for a fact. Um, certainly he's brushed it. That I know. I have seen him pictures of him doing so. But whether he got his hands involved in some level of that I don't honestly know. But again, he did use that boring on where he, in this case, it's very evident, but he digs in and forms those wings and so forth. How, how are the pieces signed? How are the pieces signed? Um, variety of ways, and it's a good question. Like I said, I should have possibly to see. Because once they're framed, you often can't see that right now because they're against a wall. Although when I did frame them, I left the backs open, so that's there for people to see. Um, various ways. The most common probably, uh, it's stamped underneath the piece, if it's an owl like that, or on the back of a plate. And it's usually marked Edition Picasso, <laughs> block letters. And then it usually includes a little mushroom shaped mark, uh, which is the plant mark for Maduro, for the pottery, where, where, they, where he made that. Um, some of them are going to be numbered, and some are not. There's another mark that's used called Depre Picasso, that's less seldom seen. Um, I'll tell you what you won't see in the editions. And if you see them, the Trevor Museum store, or Padilla in Mexico, uh, if it's signed on the face of the plate, Picasso, it's not one of the original ones that he made in Maduro, um, unless it's a unique piece. So just to make everything more confusing, but, um, but if you do find the editions, at least you could verify by looking at the catalog raisonne and seeing if each one is illustrated as well as very well described. So there's a variety of marks and there will always be a mark to all of Yes. Yes, um, in the 60s, that we lived in Colorado Springs and there was a, a store called Newsteaders, which was kind of like the Neiman Marcus for Colorado. And they sold Picasso <coughs> owls, my parents bought one. Uh, and I always wondered, I knew they weren't made by Picasso, they were, it was a limited edition, but did that happen a lot at that time? And were they actually authorized by Picasso? Oh, okay. I, I'm sure that they were authorized by the Remiers, at least, um, to, to purchase, uh, you know, X number or something, I guess, and then sell them. I don't think it happened a lot. Uh, most of them, people bought right at Maduro. And in the early days, they were virtually souvenirs. They were, you know, $200, $100. I mean, that was a lot of money back then, too, correspondingly. But, you know, they weren't expensive pieces. They were something that you came home with, you know. Uh, it's wonderful. I bought a beautiful collection in Oakland once from two people who were school teachers. They didn't have a lot of money to throw around. But they had a beautiful collection they bought them way back in the 50s. And, uh, they weren't expensive. 
you know. So, but I don't think too many department stores have them. Maybe more than I know. I didn't that question, did I? It's Sorry. Right. I have um, two questions from the chat. Yes. Um, so the first one is for the ceramics that were duplicated, I assume they were hand painted and who did the painting on the duplicates? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I don't need to repeat no. that. Okay. Um, he did, it's the same, the same with all of the editions. In many instances, he painted them himself. And most instances, I'd say he was making 400 of something, you know probably hands on paint with the first three or four. The rest would have been done by Potter's working there. But not to say that he didn't interfere or you know jump in from time to time. And sometimes we'll have a color variant come along as well. It's still part of the addition, but it'll be a funny color, which is a little scary because at first you're not sure if someone fooled with it or if it's not real, but there are indeed color variants out there. But most of that hands-on work after the initial one is going to have been done by others. But it's all under the supervision, for the most part, for the Remiers. So you know, it's very legitimate. Were the glazes such that one could put soup in it, salad? Did people use them for everyday use? I, I don't think hardly anybody ever used them for everyday use. Now. It's interesting, you know, there's these little black and white bowls that he made, and we call them bowls, so as not to offend, because they're ashtrays. So those were used, people put their cigarette butts out in those, you know, and actually, you, you, you can wash them, you won't hurt them in that respect, although the ones that are not glazed, you could, you could, you could hurt the biscuit, you could stain it. Um, uh, what else did you ask about? Oh, whether you use... Oh, here's yours. I don't know if this is a true story or not. I purchased 12 of one edition, these the green and black Toro plates. Uh, he, he probably made 500 of them. I don't know without looking it up. But um, I bought 12 from a dealer uh, in New York. And he told me that, oh gosh, what's her name? You can help me with this. The name of the uh, one of his patrons, um, a gay woman. Uh, thank you, Gertrude Stein. Somebody said it. That's it. I heard Gertrude Stein bought them, put glass plates on top of them, and then ate off her. I, I, I wasn't invited to dinner, so I don't know. <laughs> Maybe she did. She, you know, she could have. Yeah, talk about the economy of wine and I know that he did. I mean, I'm sure sometimes he just, you know, like when he went there that day and made those bowls, I mean, he may have had it in his head already, but I, I'm pretty sure he just went at it, you know. I mean, he, he did that with drawing, right? He was very spontaneous. Um, so, but I do know, like, for example, when he went back to uh, Madura in 1947, that time more on a mission to start working in ceramics, he took sketches with him that he had made while he was away. So he definitely did do that at times, took ideas and ideas from paintings and, and so forth, you know? Um, and some of those, this, might, this is an interesting technique that he used, like on, on that, which is like a lino cut. He, he literally took a piece of clay and did an impression in that, and then took that and stamped it into another piece. That was actually a technique that he used on those. Um, so much of his friends, I guess, really, but so much more texture. I can repeat these. Can you use the term um, with it? A charger is that the same as a platter? Yeah, it's it's just a, a large round uh, platter. Uh, that's it has been, or no? Um, very shallow. Shallow. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, not a big bowl. He did make bowls, little ones called coupels, and then a, a bigger size. 
um, in the editions. I mean, we did all kinds of wider things on its own, but most of these are simple forms. I have one more question. So um, George Brock and Picasso were artists in the same period. Um, are their styles similar? Well, Brock and Picasso worked together and with other artists as well, but really they were the leaders in, in the whole Cubist movement. You know, they invented it. Um, so at a, at a certain point in time, they definitely worked similarly. Now, throughout the entire of Brock's career, or were his works paralleling Picasso's? I couldn't say that. I'm not an expert on Brock, but the Brock's that I've seen are very similar. I mean, he did, you know, he, like in my mind, I can see, you know, a, a bird flying in the air, very, very simple. And with that economy, a line that we're talking about. But to say that their works were similar throughout the spans of their lives, I for sure, certainly for a period of time. And then um, also, did the piece found in the concrete dump have recognizable signature? Yeah, it's marked underneath. Um, in that case, I think it's marked Edition Picasso, um, and it would have the Medura plant for mushroom stamp on it. Um, definitely, it was marked. It's got everything on it, it's supposed to say. And um, I'm trying to believe it. Numbers. I can't find that handy. But uh, definitely it was marked underneath without any doubt at all, all of these were. So yeah, you think to yourself, how could somebody not even, they just didn't look. And you know what, the thing is too, that they, um, like I said, when, when I initially was working with these, people didn't even believe they were real anyway. They just did it. Oh, that's not a Picasso, that can't be. So, you know, whoever owned that, lost it in a, in a cement dump. Um, probably never, probably thought it was nothing. Take one more question. Where where was the dump? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to get there and see if there's more? It, it's in, it was in Germany. <laughs> that doesn't never went down very much. I never he never came up with any more Picasso's for me either. So I'm pretty I bet he scoured that place before he told me how he thought it for sure. So yes, I think that's enough time, right? Yeah, let's give Vivian one more. Thank you for being here.